Well, welcome to the Debunking Economics Podcast with Professor Steve Keen. I'm Phil Dobby. And today, well, the West has been living beyond its means for quite some time, as the UN report out this week shows, saying one million species face extinction. But we're not one of them. So what do we care? Unless you're poor, of course. So today we ask that timeless question, why are some countries so rich and some so poor? And what can we do about it? A good question to ask is one particularly rich child is born in London and the world goes gaga over it. Uh, That's today on the Debunking Economics podcast. So, Steve, the rich, the poorest nations in the world, they are the Democratic Republic of Congo, the DRC, which we used to know as uh, Zaire, Mozambique, Uganda, Tajikistan, Yemen, Haiti, Ethiopia, Tanzania. Now, many of these are in Africa. Many of them are at war. Many of them are rich in mineral reserves, so we can't actually put it down to the fact that these are sparse countries with not much to to call on. Um, In fact, in various points in history, many of these countries, the West has kindly helped to extract some of their reserves. That's been really nice of them, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But let's let's start with the DRC, the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. It's got the lowest GDP in the world. It's got millions of people. It's got a civil war. It's got outbreaks of Ebola. It's not a great place to live. Its growth is around 2%. It's been hit hard by commodity prices. There's less demand from China for what they they are doing. And their currency, the Congolese franc, has fallen a lot against the US dollar. But these are all artificial things, aren't they? I mean, they, you know, it's, this is all to do with with money and international trade. If they just block themselves off from the vagaries of, yeah, you know, the value of currencies, and they had their resources, surely they do better. So that raises the question, you know, why are some countries so rich and why are some so poor? Well, and a lot of that actually relates back to an obvious answer for Africa, and that's slavery. Uh, the decimation of, uh, of African culture by the whole slavery trade, which you know, goes back you know, right to about the, the 1400s in, in Europe, and then, of course, very, very uh, dramatic for the industrialization of America. That was a huge part of why these countries have been devastated. Uh, and and uh, the extent to which the colonial powers played one tribe off against another, setting up some of the conflicts we've seen happen here, uh, there's been, it was a huge destruction in the productive capacity of Africa and also of, uh, of India. Mm. And that's something which, which when you've got a, a legacy like that where you've destroyed what was a viable society, uh, then it takes a long, long time to rebuild that society. But it doesn't look like it's getting rebuilt anytime soon. I'm just wondering, you know, on this whole thing about uh, the artificiality of money. So the 20 poorest countries have an average income of $1,000 a year, which is three less than $3 a day. But three dollars a day would be fine, wouldn't it? If you didn't have those links to the U.S. dollar, three dollars a day is more than enough to feed your family. If you can feed your family on one dollar a day, it's you know, it's like it, the the problem is international trade, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think we've we've actually again, I think economic theory has led us massively astray here because economic theory, first of all, says you'll benefit by specialisation. So if one country specialises in, for example, diamonds, let's call that the Congo, mm-hmm. and other country specialises in uh, in in, to, in 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 tools, let's say like Germany, uh, then they'll both gain because there'll be a a, a reallocation away from. Uh, using the same technology, I might add, that's part of the theory, uh, a reallocation towards where the Congo has a comparative advantage did over Germany, everybody benefits. Yeah. Now, that, that uh, first of all, as, as I've uh, satirised in, uh, in my Econ Comics book, uh, that requires the free movement of capital from one industry to another, which is simply impossible. Uh, you can't convert machines that make machine tools into machines that for dig up diamonds. Yeah. Uh, you simply can't do it. Uh, but also, when we've seen historically, uh, the countries that industrialised most rapidly, and this includes America, went through a period where they protected the domestic industries in the way that you're saying. And Michael Hudson has an excellent book, one of his very first on this topic, called America's Protectionist Takeoff. So America, which was a fairly underdeveloped country, you know, from about uh, you know, the late 1400s to about um, 1600, uh, in in the late 1700s, early 1800s they put up large tariffs and basically meant you, you, you had to pay huge prices to buy that British steel or German steel or you could establish your own steel industry. And because they had the economies of scale that were thrown open by the 
in the entire American continent and the whole Manifest Destiny movement from the East Coast to the West, uh, they uh, dramatically industrialised and within about 30 years were a rival to uh, Europe and its industries rather than being a backwater as they were before the protectionist period. So mm. insulating yourself from trade using your resources and forcing your local capitalists to invest and improve the technology over time, that's been a successful recipe for for many countries. And yet what we sell to them is the idea you should actually be mm. uh, liberalising, opening up to free trade. That's that's the mantra they're taught. And it, it and doesn't, no, doesn't and all, work in theory, it doesn't work in practice. And all we need is your local currency to reach parity with uh, with currencies in the West and everything will be fine. But, of course, that, that whole argument of comparative advantage also disappears out the window, doesn't it, the moment countries start investing in other countries. So uh, if they were mining uh, for all of those uh, diamonds by themselves rather than having foreign entities doing it, maybe they would be slightly better off. But let me play something from the vice president of research at the St. Louis Fed, in the Federal Reserve in the United States. He's called B. Rabikumar. Uh, he did a video, his take on why some countries are so rich and others are so poor. He says the income gap between the richest and the poorest countries has grown from a factor of two to a factor of 35. And here is his explanation of why the reason for this, for this difference. So the way economists look at it is that let's go measure the inputs. What are the inputs? Some examples of inputs are physical capital and human capital. So let's think about physical capital for a minute. Physical capital could be all kinds of equipment and structures sitting in an economy. So you got buildings, you got laptops, you got lathes, you got assembly lines. Human capital could be measured in lots of ways. Schooling, for instance, is a form of human capital. Other forms of human capital could be just learning on the experience, on the job training. At best, these inputs account for 40 to 50 percent. That's all you can explain in terms of cross-country income differences. That means there's a bulk of it that we do not know that we cannot measure directly using inputs. So that's what's causing these differences. So the part that we do not know, economists typically call total factor productivity. Now, total factor productivity is one of those objects that you don't get to see directly, but you get to infer it indirectly. So it looks at how efficiently these inputs are transformed into output. So given the same amount of input, a country that transforms it more efficiently will have higher GDP. Countries that take those inputs and transform them inefficiently will have lower GDP, but without a model, it's very difficult to proceed any farther than what I've told you in terms of just accounting. So that's what economists work on right now. I'm currently thinking about the angle of how much of a role that international trade plays in thinking about cross-country income differences. <laughs> so there we go. It's all international trade. Mm. Um, but, I mean, the inputs aren't the same. So he's saying, you know, the, the inputs aren't the same and then how those inputs are created to create wealth are different. But if the inputs aren't the same, you're never going to get the ability to use those inputs more effectively, are you? So surely, no, that, no. surely that's the answer to foreign aid, isn't it? We just need to make sure the uh, the whole world has, you know, a similar level of inputs into their economy, whether it's education or whether it's resources, uh, technology. Surely if we did that, we'd be a long way towards solving the problem, wouldn't we? Well, I think it's, it's the whole idea that it's total factor productivity, again, is where economic theory is leading us astray because that's that the, the thinking that comes out of that is looking at what's called the Cobb-Douglas production function, where they say that output is a function of the amount of labour you have raised to one power uh, times the amount of capital raised to one minus that power, so you get constant returns to scale, mm. times the factor they call total factor productivity. Now, uh, this idea of total factor productivity is supposed to ab uh, absorb the change in technology uh, that occurs over time. Uh, but in fact, uh, when it was, the economists expected most of the change in GDP to be caused by a change in labour or a change in capital. And when they broke it down to the three elements where that change could occur, one was this total factor productivity, another labour, another capital, they found 85% of it turned up in being the total factor productivity element, which is why they talk about total factor productivity. And they look about, you know, whether it's human capital or yada, yada, yada. When I look at this, I always thought total factor productivity was just a total kludge uh, because it 
it is a residual in the model. The model itself talks about labor and capital producing output. When I worked out the energy equation a couple of years ago and I fed that into the Cobb Ductus production function, uh, the, uh, my argument was that what we're actually doing with both machines and labor is taking energy we find in the universe, which neither be committed to created nor destroyed, taking that energy, converting part of it into useful work and the rest into necessarily into waste, uh, and then that useful work becomes GDP. When you factor that through the equation, what turned up as being the total factor productivity term was in fact the contribution of the energy throughput of the representative machine at the time to production. So what we're we're measuring as an increase in total factor productivity is actually an increase in the capacity of our machines to process energy. So is that what's needed in these countries, in the poor countries? Do we need machines that are able to process and make greater use of energy and create that output? Uh, Is that the difference? We'll look at that in the full edition of this podcast. If you want to hear it in full, you need to subscribe at debunkingeconomics.com or become a supporter of Steve Keen on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash prof Steve Keen. Play ten dollars or more support each month and they'll get access to this and all the other podcasts in this series we're getting close to 150 of them so we hope to see you back here very soon thanks for listening 